It was to, to, to see him. But there's some people who are here that I never got to meet him, but there are people, we have a person here who did not only get to meet him, but worked intimately with him for, for many years uh, in the front office of the Philadelphia Athletics. And that man is Dick Armstrong, who can tell you stories about Connie Mack that I can't even be begin to think about. So, Dick, please. Coming back, congratulations to the winner of the bouquet. When it was a police officer, I got a little suspicious. <laughs> At least uh, after a program like this, Dick, you didn't have to say our next speaker needs no introduction. He didn't show up. <laughs> now, I'm delighted to be here tonight, and, and especially to have a chance to see uh, somebody I admire very much. Senator. Senator Connie Mack, uh, who I've told several times, reminds me so much of his dad, who I really liked when I was working at the athletics. Well, I'm delighted uh, to have a chance to talk from a different perspective, uh, not as an historian, but as a person who, with memories. Um, I was invited, I guess, because I happened to be the last surviving member of the Philadelphia Athletics front office executive staff. That's what happens when you live long enough. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm older than Connie Mack was when he retired. I've been asked to share some of my memories of Mr. Mack. Notice I said Mr. Mack. No one who worked for him ever called him Connie Mack. Ira Thomas, his longtime friend, whose picture you saw several times here, probably didn't identify him. But he was one of his older friends and uh, uh, was the only one I ever heard personally. I think Jack Coombs was the other one who ever called him Connie. To the rest of us, he was always Mr. Mac, and to his sons, he was Dad. I have a vivid mental picture of Mr. Mac's face. I've never, never forgotten. Some people get better looking with age, and he was one of them. In his later, later years, he had a wonderfully photogenic face. His benign countenance reflected his wisdom, his good nature, his character. You've heard a lot about that. And I want to testify in support of what Norman has said, that he was the finest, one of the finest gentlemen I've ever known. I say one of them because I've known others too, but he was absolutely uh, a man I revered. He was kind, he was considerate. He was a man of faith, high principles, whose word was his bond, who never used profanity, and who treated others, no matter who they were, whatever level, with courtesy and respect. Perhaps I should uh, explain how I came to be working for him. In October 1947, I told you I've been around a while, uh, after my inconspicuous season as a player in the A's minor league farm system, Art Ehlers, the farm director, uh, they were just starting the farm system in those days, called me in, knowing I was a college graduate, and asked me if I would like to be the business manager of their new Class D Farm Club in Portsmouth, Ohio. Would I? I just couldn't imagine a more exciting opportunity. They sent me to be to a, a business manager's conference, uh, where I remember hearing Branch Rickey, whom you mentioned, Norman, speak for the first time. And uh, I've never forgotten that first time, because he inspired all of us there with what baseball uh, meant and means to America. Armed with the notes that I had taken from the various presenters in that uh, almost two week period in Columbus, Ohio, and with my newly wedded wife Margie by my side and all our earthly possessions in our car, uh, we headed out to Portsmouth to begin an exciting adventure. Portsmouth uh, nearly won the pennant that year. We led the Ohio-Indiana League in attendance. That was in 1948. 
following year, we were again in the thick of the pennant race, and I asked Art Ehlers if there were any possibility of our having a Connie Mack day in Portsmouth, Ohio. And Art said he would ask Mr. Mack. And I was absolutely thrilled when Art called me to tell me that Mr. Mack said he would do it. We agreed on a date that would fit into his schedule, and the mayor of Portsmouth issued a proclamation declaring July 25, 1949 to be Connie Mack Day. The city, like you all have done so well, went all out in preparing for this big event. And when Mr. Mack arrived, um, accompanied by Art Ehlers, we whisked him to a luncheon that was uh, sponsored by or hosted by the mayor of the city and the Chamber of Commerce. And the minor league commissioner at that time, George Troutman, the president of our league, and several other uh, dignitaries were gathered. Each had a few words to say, but I want to tell you it was Connie Mack who stole the hearts of the people. They absolutely fell in love with him. That afternoon there was a big parade, like you're going to have tomorrow, and people lined the streets to catch a glimpse of the grand old man of baseball. And uh, Mr. Mack, I can see him returning their waves and smiling, waving his hat, and uh, the people loved it, and so did Mr. Mack. He uh, posed for all kinds of people, uh, pictures with people, signed autographs, visited with the folks. It was a, it was a marvelous experience for the city and, and for, I, I think, for, for him, because he was doing something that he knew really meant something to these folks who never dreamed they'd have an opportunity to meet him. Well, that night we had a Connie Mack uh, night at the ballpark, and uh, he couldn't have been more uh, warmly greeted. Mayor read a proclamation. He posed with the players who were all awestruck with this man of whom they had heard but never dreamed they, the head of their organization they'd ever been in person. Now fast forward to October. We had won the pennant and again led the league in attendance. And I was an ambitious young man and I uh, scheduled a meeting to see Art Ehlers back in Philadelphia and was thinking about how I would broach the subject of perhaps moving up in the organization a little bit, one of the higher farm clubs. When I walked into his office in the tower of Shy Park, Art greeted me warmly. Before I got a word out of my mouth, he said, Dick, how would you like to set up a public relations department for the Philadelphia Athletics? I, 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 you know, after I got up off the floor, I, I was absolutely thrilled. I, mean, I said, wait, wait, wait a minute now, he said. Uh, there are several advertising agencies and public relations firms bidding on the contract. The one we had used in previous years also did the Phillies, called Adelphia Associates. You might have heard your dad mention that. And they had done a good job, but they, they were, they, we were an encounter there. So we didn't have our own department. They didn't do the kinds of promotional things that we could do. And so Art said, you have uh, three days to get a proposal in. So I went back to Princeton, where we were staying for a few days uh, with my wife's parents and uh, worked day and night and came up with a proposal. Well, I uh, drove it down to the ballpark, handed it to Art Ailes, who had set up a meeting for me to meet the directors and turn it in and answer their questions and so on. Went back nervously to Princeton and awaited the results. Well, the phone rang again. It was Art. He said, Nick, you've got the job. Mr. Mack remembered you from Portsmouth. When can you start? Right away. So that was fabulous. So that began another adventure. Now one of the first things I did soon after I arrived on the scene was to engage a polling expert who I happened to know who was teaching a public uh, opinion course at a local uh, uh, college in Brooklyn, Philadelphia. And he had his class conduct a survey, which we drafted. I wanted to find out what the public was thinking about the A's before we started anything because I had some things in mind. And uh, when we got the results back, they weren't all positive by any means. Uh, a lot of people resented the breakup of the dynasties, which you've 
seen so well portrayed uh, by our, our previous speakers. Uh, Mr. Mack uh, was often asked why he had sold so many of his great players. And I can hear him say uh, over and over again, I didn't want to sell those players, but I needed the money. <laughs> I used to be able to imitate him so well that people on the phone couldn't tell what he was mad. I had some fun with that every now and then. Um, so we, uh, so you know, taking that seriously, your dad was one of them, Senator Mack. Uh, he took that very seriously, and they said we needed to spend some money to try to build a club. So they bought a guy named Bob Dillinger from the St. Louis Browns, who hit 315 uh, the year before. Well, after a few weeks, we discovered why the Browns are so happy to get rid of him. And Mr. Mack had to get rid of him. And that's a story in itself, in the mid-season. So it, it back, backfired. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Art Ehlers had told me that what caught the director's attention uh, in my proposal was um, my outline of a suggested extended promotion and celebration of Connie Mack's 50th year as manager of the athletics to be called, I suggested, the Golden Jubilee. Well, the amazing thing was that none of those other agencies that had been had done anything with that. But I thought it was a natural. So apparently they thought that was it. So I was given a green light to go ahead and put that plan into action. So immediately I did, with all kinds of help from everybody, including uh, Roy Mack and Connie Mack Jr. and uh, Mr. Mack himself. A blue ribbon Connie Mack Golden Jubilee Committee was formed, prominent Philadelphians, uh, and with the uh, governor of Pennsylvania and the mayor of Philadelphia and the two United States senators as co-chairs of, uh, of the committee. And we had a great honorary chairperson and an active chairman and our offices were in City Hall with a staff there. And they were busy from then on planning all kinds of activities. And we were working very closely together. Mr. Mack was happy with, with the whole idea, and he made himself available to us from day one. That winter, he appeared on every local radio station, every local TV station. There were newspaper articles, columns galore. Two books were published under his name. We published the Golden uh, Jubilee Yearbook, which was available at the time for the season. And uh, it was, uh, we had several of the local sports writers contributing to its contents. The attention was not confined to Philadelphia either. There were feature articles on Connie Mack in many magazines, and he appeared on national radio shows like The Cavalcade of America, We the People, you probably never even heard of those, but they were very well known in those days. And uh, Ed Sullivan produced his famous show in New York. Uh, he brought his show from New York, the first time they'd ever gone on the road, brought it down to Philadelphia, and dedicated and featured uh, Connie Mack. Uh, that was the first time he'd ever done that. It ever happened before. It was a big, big event. Um, I tried to get Congress, I didn't know you then, but I tried to get Congress to approve a special commemorative stamp, uh, but they told me that that was only done for deceased persons. So it went for the entire preseason. The Phillies were upset because the A's were getting all the publicity. They could hardly get a mention in the local papers, and the Fuhrer continued during spring training. And I must say that Mr. Mack was amazing. He seemed to, to thrive on all the attention that he was getting. He was constantly being interviewed and signing autographs, and posing for photographs. And speaking of photographs, I asked Mr. Mack, just to show you the kind of person he was, and so, so helpful to me as a young person. He, I asked Mr. Mack if he would come out to Wright Field, that's where we trained in uh, West Palm Beach very early in the morning before anyone else was around and put on a uniform and, and let the club photographer, who I swore to secrecy, um, pose for some uh, photographs 
in his baseball uniform. I chose one of them. You know, as you've heard, he never wore a uniform. I hadn't had one on for 50 years. So um, I put, chose one with him, and, and you've seen it. It's in his book. Uh, there's pictures of it out there with the catcher's mitt. And I sent that out without a story, just a caption. A's sign new rookie. <laughs> and it was used everywhere. It was a testimony of the fact that I used to say that more people in the United States and around the world could recognize Connie Mack than they could the President of the United States. Of course, he was ha taller than Harry Truman, but even so, uh, it was amazing how well recognized he was. He was so exposed, especially during this uh, 1950 year celebration. Um, we needed a theme song, so I wrote the Connie Mack Swing which was introduced by the poli uh, Philadelphia Police Fireman's Band on opening day. There was something special going on just about every game. So, we, so it went on into the season. There, all kinds of promotions. For example, Paul Whiteman, you remember that name, the great orchestra, the orchestra leader? He brought his t whole TV team club, it's a big, uh, well-known television program down in Philadelphia and put on a show before the game. They did a big feature on the Connie Mack Swing and sang it and danced to it and everything. And uh, the celebrations weren't limited to Shy Park. Every, every park had a, some kind of a Connie Mack celebration the first time the A's went there that season. Everything, everything was going absolutely right. Except one thing. Our ball club. We got off to a horrible start, and then it was downhill from there. Um, five, not to go into too much detail, but five of our starting pitchers that, that rotated in starting roles in 1949, when the A's were pennant contenders, those five pitchers won 73 games among them. In 1950, those same five pitchers who were still with the A's won 19 games. That's 54 game turnaround. Now, if you took it, it's not only taking it off one, it's doing the other. It's 108 games. Unfortunately, we had a couple of other pitchers that added, so we did manage to win a few games. And if I figured out one time we could have added a high, something like 837 runs, we could have won a few more games. But, but in any case, um, we had this horrible experience. And in the meantime, the Phillies. 1950. Remember the Phillies? They had the Whiz Kids. And they captured the fans. And the Phillies fans themselves, who were totally starved for a winner, you know, and so angry about what had happened all before they hadn't gotten any publicity. They were winning, we were losing, and were they having fun at our expense? It was really worth your life to tell somebody you worked for the A's in those days that that person happened to be a Phillies fan. You really got it. Um, and in the meantime, from a personal standpoint, I had gotten to be very close to Mr. Mack. Um, I handled much of his personal correspondence. Um, I would go into his office, this is almost a daily thing, and he would talk to me about certain letters that were not were beyond the ones that he would scribble in his own handwriting, but letters that, were, that had something to do with the, either the uh, Connie Mack Golden Jubilee celebration, or something of that nature. Tell me what to write, and I'd write it and take it back and sign it. And so he would talk in those times, and I got to know him even in a more in a, in a closer way. Um, I admired him. He was an older man, sometimes somewhat confused. But uh, one year, I'll tell you how confused he was. He asked me to do his income tax for him. And I, I've given all this stuff to the Hall of Fame, but I actually have a sheet of paper on which he, in his own handwriting, wrote down his expenses and his charitable contributions. And uh, so I saw that his salary was $20,000. I didn't feel so bad after all of what they were paying me when I saw that the president was only getting $20,000. At the end of the 1950 season, Mr. Mack announced his retirement as manager. Jimmy Dykes uh, became his successor. 
and Jimmy Dykes takes credit for my going into the ministry, which I did later, <laughs> because he said anybody that works for me for six years is bound to go into the priesthood. But at the end of the 1951 season, the A's, now this is something that a, a lot of even A's fans don't remember. At the end of the 1951 season, the A's were the hottest team in baseball. They were absolutely burning up, and they were playing the top teams. Uh, they had not gotten off to a great start, but they were knocking off all the top teams. And uh, it was uh, incredible. And we had some of the great stars in baseball on our team. We had Gus Sterniel, the home run, American League home run king, the American League RBI king that year, 1951. We had Ferris Fane, the American League batting champion. We had a little guy, only five feet six and three quarters inches, who won 18 games that year, named Bobby Shantz, who the following year was voted the most valuable player in the American League, he won 24 games and lost only seven. And we had fantastic fielders. But that's not all. We had the best second base combination in baseball history. And I will argue with anyone who wants to challenge me on that statement. Eddie Juice and, and Pete Stevens, too. Watching them day after a day was like watching a beautiful symphony orchestra. The choreography of their play was fabulous. The way they worked together. And, uh, of course, along with Hank Majeski at third and Ferris Fane at first, other people take part in double plays, even the outfielders who make uh, plays. And at the end of that season, um, they had completed uh, a record that has never been broken. We only played 154 games. They now play 162, and that, game, that record still stands. So, um, I decided to write a poem about it, send it out as a press release, and I'm going to close with this. Um, it's a takeoff on Franklin Pierce Adams' famous poem about those three cubs, Tinker and Evers to Chance. Some of you might remember that. The here is juice to suitor to fame. Voluminous prose has been written by those who have this one thought to advance, that the greatest combine in the double play line was Tinker to Evers to Chance. Those three famous Cubs were surely not dubs, their feeling was something sublime. They were far and away the class of their day, the double play kings of their time. But they've since been dethroned and partly disowned. No longer as kings do they reign, for a new DP team is ruling supreme, known as Juice, to Suter, to Fame. These sensational A's have perfected their ways to the point where they lead all the rest as twin killings go. Three years in a row they've ranked at the, as the major league's best. There's never a worry. They'll comply in a hurry when a quick double play is desired. A roller or a liner just couldn't be finer. You can bet the two men are retired. You may already know what the record books show. For years they've continued to shine, all others surpassing this record amassing a total of 629. Eddie Juiced rings the bell as a shortstop, as a mighty good man with a stick. To find someone who has an arm that's as true, it would be an impossible thing. On second there stands the man with the hands. If a ball's hit to Pete, there's no doubt. You never need look. Jot it down in your book. It's obsessive the batter is out. A hitter's a curse with Ferris on first. There's no one as clever as he at spearing a bounder or sizzling grounder and completing that tough 3-6-3. Three, three. A long time from now, when they're telling you of how so-and-so could get two with no strain, we'll think of the days of Connie Max A's and of Juice and Suter. 
and fame. tell you that he later became the first public relations director for the newly formed Baltimore Orioles. He, he covers uh, all of this in, in detail in his book, uh, Sense of Being Called, which uh, tells the amazing story of how he got from baseball into the ministry. He is only the, he's the only front office, executive, front office executive ever to do that. Since he and his son have to leave this evening, will not be here for the book signing tomorrow. Uh, he will stay for a while following the program uh, and autograph copies of the book for those of you who would like to purchase them. He will be out in the lobby out there uh, at a table. Uh, the book is called A Sense of Being Called. And uh, unfortunately, Dick can't be with us tomorrow, so please uh, support him as, as, you, as you best you can. Our final speaker tonight is going to talk about an event that occurred here in 1934. Um, Brendan Avery is a historian and a librarian in, in North Brookfield. And the story of, uh, of uh, Connie Mack bringing a team here in 1934 and the kind of uh, the great uh, uh